Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This time out, our special guest is Sean Drover from Megadeth. Thanks for being here, man. Pleasure, thanks. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks for having me. You're actually celebrating your 10th anniversary with Megadeth, right? Yeah, actually, October 15th was uh, was 10 years, so uh, must be doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're the, uh, the uh, aside from Dave Mustaine and Dave Ellison, you've been in the group the longest of, uh, yeah. of any member. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty incredible. Congratulations. Thanks. thanks. So how'd you get started? How did you get started playing drums? Uh, my whole family uh, are musicians. Uh, well, on the male side, my father was a guitar player. My older brother, Brian, was a guitar player. And uh, my younger brother, Glenn, uh, started taking up guitar um, when he was about nine. And right around that time, I was 12 at the time, and I really started to become interested as well. But um, I just kind of gravitated. I had, I had a rhythmic sense. Uh, I, I knew it as a young child. I used to get in trouble in school by banging on my desk. You have to write lines in the tension. I will not bang on my desk. I'm a piano. <laughs> so I knew I had a, a rhythmic sensibility. So I just kind of gravitated towards drums. And uh, we started kind of playing. I started playing about right around 13, just before my 13th birthday. And, uh, you know, here we are many, many, many years, years later. later so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so did you take lessons? Did you teach yourself? I never, I, I never did. Um, there was a local guy in town. He, he was a, a senior in high school. And that's actually who I, I would buy drums off him piece by piece. He didn't have like, you know, full kits. Like, oh, I got a snare. I got a couple of, of rack toms and stuff. And I, and I built my kit over the course of time. And, uh, but, you know, just other than looking, watching him play, I, mean, I never mm -hmm. really had any formal lessons or anything. I just kind of learned by ear and by sight. Right. So picking so, things off record. Absolutely. Those, those yeah. Playing along yeah. to records as I, you know, as I started, to, got a real kit and started to play, put the headphones on and, and uh, just learning, um, you know, simple tunes and, right. and kind of going from there. What kind of things were you working on? What kind of music were you into? Uh, first, I mean, to, to play to, it was, it was pretty much Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, simpler songs, you know, Smoke in the Water, mm -hmm. um, Cat Scratch Fever by Ted Nugent, stuff like that, stuff that was, you know, wasn't too rhythmically challenging. Um, you know, I knew with some work I could pull it off at a certain point. My brother was doing the same thing on guitar. We were kind of learning together. He would learn, okay, let's learn this song. Let's learn Smoke in the Water today, or let's learn right. uh, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. And we would learn it together and just kind of play. So it was, it was kind of a cool thing I got to, you know, I got to play really early on feeding off of another, uh, another player instead mm -hmm. of just playing to headphones, which is great as well, but actually having a guitar player to bounce on, and play to, you know. Right. So I really learned early on how the importance of that, you know what I mean? So it's great to feed off other players and I think that ultimately makes you a uh, better player in the end as well. Yeah, you get that intera interaction Absolutely, that you yeah. can't get when you're, yeah. when you're playing along. Right, yeah. right. So you also ended up picking up guitar. <clears throat> yeah, the same, Nevada. pretty much a year later, once I, again, it was all through just watching my brother as he was learning. He was learning at a really rapid pace. And I knew f very early on uh, he was going to be a really great guitar player. I mean, he was, God, I think by the age of, probably within a year, he, he emulated um, the solo for Money by Pink Floyd, n note by note, by within a year of him picking up a guitar. Right. So I'm just like, okay, this, this kid is really, you know, going to be great, and, and he is. Um, but, the, you know, I, I, just being a musician, I appreciated. I wasn't just, you know, the, the, the guy who had to play drums. I also appreciated guitarists uh, to a great extent. You know, I was a big mm -hmm. Pat Travers fan, Eddie Van Halen, all the, you know, Richie Blackmore, of course, all these guys, right. you know. So I also gravitated towards, uh, towards guitar. Now, I'm not nowhere near uh, what my brother is, of course, but, uh, but I, you know, um, it really became a valuable thing for me because over the course of time, um, I put out, we put out several uh, albums. My, re my brother and I had a band called Eidolon and, and, mm -hmm. uh, that came out uh, in the mid-90s and we put out um, six records and uh, I wrote, I would say, 95% of that material on guitar. So right. it, it really helped me to become a, a songwriter, obviously learning guitar, but also being a drummer, I ha always had that sensibility of, you know, I'm going to write this song now, but I need to make sure that, you know, thinking of drums and guitar while I'm writing this song instead of just writing riffs and, you know, here, you play, and it's like, you know, impossible to play. I had kind of both sides of uh, the balance, you know, you mm -hmm. know, from a guitar side and also from, from a, a rhythmic uh, perspective with drums. So it worked right. out pretty cool for me. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So beyond the arranging aspect of making sure the guitar and the drums and everything work, what do you find that each of those gives to the other? What does being a guitar player bring to you as a drummer and vice versa? First and foremost, I consider myself a drummer, obviously, because I'm, I'm a much better drummer. I couldn't go on stage and do a seminar tonight in front of 100 people and, and break down, you know, chord sequences and, and uh, all that kind of stuff because I'm not that far of advanced of a player. So for me, I'll, I'll always primarily consider myself a drummer and actually more, almost more of a songwriter than, than uh, uh, a guitar shredder or, or um, 
someone who could teach theory. I'm, I'm not that guy at all. Okay. I can do it on drums, certainly, but on guitar, I just, I completely play by feel. I couldn't tell you, you know, aside from, you know, like G, A, E, I know the simple chords and sure. stuff, but um, I don't know anything about theory, anything like that at all. I couldn't tell you the first thing about it. I, I come from a complete place of just feel and adaptation, just, just winging it and goofing around and coming up with chords, a chord structure that, wow, that's cool. Right. I'm going to record it on my iPhone, and, and then it, you know, all of a sudden I compile these riffs, and I have a, a song that I've assembled. This is of course now, of course, not 30 years ago, but right. um, I don't know necessarily that it's helped me either way. I don't know if my guitar playing has helped me as a drummer or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I just think I, I just kind of look at it as one kind of complete thing. Like you know, I'm just I, I consider myself a, a, a songwriter and and a drummer. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't say I'm a guitar. You know, I I, I do play guitar. Right. It might be kind of a weird thing to say. I, I, I just consider myself more of a songwriter because that's what I, I'm better at. Instead of, like, I couldn't go and join a band, a metal band, and, you know, I would make a lot of mistakes. And you know what I mean? I'm not that far advanced in terms of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm more of an arrange, song arranger and a songwriter. That's, right. that's but you have, you have played guitar on stage with Megadeth. I have. And even but, played but, some but, solos, but, right? But, yeah, but it, I mean, it's one song to go up there night after night and, and you know, and of course, I'm sure I, if you isolated that, <laughs> that track, I'm sure there were quite a few mistakes, but which is kind of funny to me, but um, it's a, that's a different ball. That's a fun thing. That's not mm -hmm. like a, we did that primarily for fun because we could, Glenn also um, is a drummer. So we, we called it the switcheroo. We probably did it five times in, in the course of uh, the time my brother was in Megadeth. And uh, it was purely a fun thing. We loved it, you know, and it kind of freaked the fans out. And right. it kind of put a smile on Dave's face as well. So, but it wasn't anything like, you know, you know, it wasn't precision based, like, you know, you have to nail down, the, you know what I mean? It was right. like, let's go up there and wing and have some fun and sure. and, and give the, the fans something to, uh, a little bit different to watch. So. Right, right, that's awesome, that's awesome. So you had the band Eidolon mm -hmm. with Glenn uh, in Canada, you'd put out six albums, yeah. and then he joined Megadeth at that point? To yeah, that's, it, that's a, it's an interesting story. I, I was actually in Sweden uh, recording the, the, what became the last Eidolon record in 2004 and uh, my brother had just gotten the call to join Megadeth and uh, so he went out to uh, Arizona mm -hmm. and began rehearsals with that and I was calling him every day on the phone, I, God knows what that phone bill was back then, <laughs> we didn't have Skype back in 2004 but uh, I called him every day from the studio, how's it going, I was so excited for him, I just couldn't believe it, you know, I was just thrilled to death and uh, um, I did the drum tracks for the record, for the Island record Sweden, um, came back home and um, it wasn't maybe, but within a week that I got, I got the phone call to also uh, join Megadeth. So mm -hmm. it was a very interesting time, certainly. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the short story of how, you know, how I got in the band. And bas I mean, basically, I knew the rehearsal schedule. I knew when they were going on tour and all that all stuff. And I, I got a call six days before um, the actual tour. And they said, uh, my brother, I was, co I was working. I was covered in sheetrock dust. <laughs> <laughs> come home from work and he said, man, you better sit down. I said, well, what's, what's the matter now? What's going on? He said, man, they, you know, uh, they got rid of the drummer. They want you in the next plane. I'm like, come on, dude, really? Like, really? It's like six days, dude. Like, right. you know, <laughs> so I just, it just, yeah, turned my life upside down from that point on. And, uh, but looking back, I, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Cause I was mm -hmm. literally thrown in the fire. It was just like, there's no time to freak out. I'm in Megadeth. None of that stuff is like, learn the songs you don't know rehearse, let's go. And that's what right. it was. Four days of rehearsal, travel day, and uh, the sixth day we were on stage in uh, Reno, Nevada. Wow, that's amazing. So That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about what it's like to step into a band that has a long legacy already and to, uh, to come in there in front of the fans who are obviously rabid fans in, sure. in, in most cases. You know, what, what is that like? For, for me, I mean, knowing the history of the band and, and stuff, I, I went in, and my brother was in the band, so I kind of got some insight to that as well, you know, asking questions, you know, how, you know, like a lot of fans, you know, what's it like working with Dave? How's you know, and so I kind of knew going in, and and I'm not the type of person who's delusional to think that you know, okay, I'm in Megadeth now. Let's do the songs that I want to do, and let's uh, let's write a bunch <laughs> of songs. I went in there, you know, look, learn, you know, know your role and do your job. Mm -hmm. Kind of really what that can apply to anything. Sure, you know, apply to an interview or a cameraman, whatever. Um, I went really went in there with, with that mentality, and and it was a genuine thing. I. I I wanted to preserve uh, the legacy of the band. I wanted people to walk away from the show going, wow, Megadeth, you know, even though they got new guys, they, they, they're still a great band. And mm -hmm. uh, I really feel that um, we did that, you know, we're still doing that, you know. Right. Um, we're one of those bands, you know, some bands have the same four or five guys for their entire career. Some bands don't. We are, 
option B. Right. We're just one of those bands. It's just, it's to me, things happen. I mean, look, you mm -hmm. know, there's so many, we can go talk about this for hours on how many bands have changed key band members and stuff. Right. So, um, again, I, I didn't think about, you know, um, I just thought about it in terms of just, again, going in there, doing the, uh, the job to the best of my capabilities, trying to make the fans happy and, and preserve uh, the legacy of this band and, and uh, hopefully enhance it. So, right. Right. Um, you know, I'm pretty proud of uh, the accomplishments we have, uh, we've had in the 30 years and, and the 10 years that I've been here. Right, right. No, I think you should be proud of that because sometimes people come into a band and they change members and the band changes. It, al you know, it, 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 it always changes, I, I th any, uh, mu musically speaking, of mm -hmm. course. You can have five different drummers, which essentially is what Megadeth's had, and even though we'll play the song pretty much the same way, pretty close, we all have l all little nuances we have uh, somewhere, yeah, right? there, you know. So it's, it's going to change a little bit, and, and I'm, I'm totally cool with that. That doesn't bother me one bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's... You, you, you can't Because you, you can't be, for me, I can't be a total robot, you know what I right. mean? And just play the songs exactly the way, that, you know, if I find that something, unless it's a real integral part of the song that you really should not change, you know what I mean? You, you wouldn't go into Rush and change Tom Sawyer, that, right. you know what I mean? It, and a lot of Megadeth parts are like that as well, but... There's certain nuances and things, uh, rhythmic patterns that, that I'll change or do how I feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I need to have at least some way of, of expressing myself, even though the fans probably don't even know it half the time. It makes me feel good, you know, to have my kind of sensibility to what I interpret the song to be, just even if it's just a small part. Right. So that, that makes, that fulfills me musically, even though I, I wasn't on the track or, or wrote the track. Mm -hmm. But so it gives me a, a feeling of... Uh, this makes me feel good. Yeah. Well, clearly you get to put your stamp on. Sure. What's what's happening there? But you're playing the songs. Sure. And the songs are, are what they are. Yeah. So, with a band like that, where the band is so tight mm -hmm. and rhythmically things are just locked right on. Yeah. Who cues that, or where does that come from within the band? Do you drive that, and everybody locks to you, or do you lock to uh, to someone it's else? It's kind of it's kind of it depends on the song. Sometimes it's kind of a combination between. Well, it's all the band. Of course, it's all the, the simple answer is, is everybody, but. A lot of times it's myself or Dave. Sometimes, you know, I, I call it kind of steering the musical train where, where a lot of songs, I'll, I'll be that guy, but certain songs Dave will kind of be, you know, he'll start a song and, and depending on the night, sometimes you're a little more jacked up, some nights you're, you know, you want to kind of pull it back a bit. So it can kind of change from night to night mm -hmm. and certainly has in the past where, you know, you feel like, yeah, it's easy to kind of, you can watch video of yourself after, you know, say, man, we were really playing that song kind of fast, you know, it's kind of getting a little out of control, so we'll kind of make a mental note to, to bring it back, or Dave will mention something, and, and so we all have input as to, you know, that kind of thing, but I think ultimately uh, the drummer has to steer the train uh, to a degree, of course, but, mm -hmm. but Dave also can, can be that guy, we can be in the middle of a song, and he'll give me a cue to, you know, hey man, you know, we've got little secret cues where, you know, He'll kind of turn a little bit sideways, and that's, that indicates, you know, let's, let's speed up a little bit. So let's, you know, fans are getting real jacked up. Let's, you know, let's really give it to them. And, right. Or he can kind of lean back, and that's kind of an indication of, you know, kind of slow down a little bit. We're kind of a little bit out of control here. So. Right. But, right. Uh, and that's where, you know, ultimately he kind of drives that train a little bit. It just depends. But mm -hmm. ultimately, I, I would say it would have to be the drummer. Sure. Know? Sure. So a few things I've noticed about your playing, uh, listening to you here, both here and uh, in recordings and things. A lot of drummers, when they play double bass, mm -hmm. it's not real consistent. There's a either a rhythmic little glitch there, or there's a volume glitch. Your your two kick drums are incredibly consistent between the two. Did you work hard on that? Was that something you really put it's, a lot it, of effort it, into? Yeah, it's it's still it's it's a continual work in progress because just like you mentioned, um, I mean, for the most part, I'm, it's weird because I'm I'm left-handed and left-footed. Mm -hmm. I you know played soccer for years, so I was left-footed. But stepping, stepping on a kid at 13 and my buddy's kit and not knowing any better, I just jumped on it and said, well, there's a bass drum. My right foot goes there. And, well, okay, I'm, this is, feels pretty cool. And, right. of course, never even knowing what that is. So I just didn't even know. Over, right? so, <laughs> and, and so, but because I'm left-footed, I kind of have a lot of power in, in, in this leg as well. So, it, it, although it, I, I do continually work on it and really try to keep that balance because, like you imply, you know, usually the right foot is the dominant foot, and, and mm -hmm. that's it's funny because it's actually what I teach a lot of my students. A lot of, a lot of them will say, you know, I'm having issues with with endurance, and that, uh, and it's always lefty it, because that's not, you know, left unless they are left footed and left handed like I am, which most of them are not. Mm -hmm. So I'll, you know, you give them exercise. Ultimately, you have to get to the point where I don't think you'll ever be completely equal. The the, the, the dominant foot will always be even a smidge 
have more power, more endurance, but mm -hmm. it's something I definitely work on a lot. And, and just that's when I do things like, the, you know, ultimately these are exercises when, I, when I'll like play and stuff. And a lot of times I'll do double bass drum stuff just to kind of get the endurance going and, and the balance going and equal power and all that stuff. And, you know, and right. I'll play and do different, different roles and different little um, ride sequences and stuff. But it's ultimately kind of a, an endurance exercise and a balance and power exercise for my, uh, for my bass drums, so, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's something you really, really need to, you know, a lot of drummers sh uh, should definitely work on it. And, and another thing with that is um, the added of, of triggers. The triggers, uh, you can hit as little or as hard as you want, and it produces the same sound, hence, right. hence the triggers. With that, you know, which, which is great for the, for the ultra speed, uh, speed bands, because as you play faster and faster and faster, it's hard to have the same velocity, it's simple, right. Can't hit as hard. It's it's difficult, mm -hmm. it's, you know. Uh, um, but the, what the triggers do, of course, is is provide that equal, you know, uh, sound hit. So it's it's mm -hmm. always the same. The, the 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 problem with that, or a potential problem with that, of course, is is kind of losing that. You know, I don't even have to hit it hard. It's just going to be crushing. So, and I was never a, a, more of an old school advocate for just you know putting, making sure that things remain you know equal mm -hmm. strength w when I do double bass drum patterns. So. So triggers or not, I, I still hit them the same way. Right, know? right. Do you recommend a lot of metronome work to? Absolutely, yeah. I, be, for many reasons, uh, with the technology uh, of today, you can you can have a metronome on your iPhone mm -hmm. or whatever phone you possess. Um, so and it's a great you know because of going in and going into any studio situation with Pro you have to play to a click. I mean, it's, you know, unless you're just going in there with a band and counting to four and just bashing it out, right. which most bands do not do that. If you want to have a professional recording where, you know, the engineer can fix things and move things and, you know, line things up to the grid. It's essential to learn to play to a click. Mm -hmm. So just on, just based on that, it's great to practice to it. Also as well, it provide it, it, the click doesn't lie. So if you're, right. it's, it's good for having that meter staying like that mm -hmm. instead of, you know, you could be playing in your basement and you really can't have, you really don't have any idea of, of your, if your tempo is fluttering. If you start the song at, you know, 120 BPMs and you end up playing 150 BPMs, how are you to know unless you really have that self-awareness, which if you're doing that, you obviously don't. Right. So playing to a click really provides that, you know, stability of, you know, keeping that click, you know, and it, it, I think it eventually becomes this, uh, you kind of internalize it and it becomes like a subconscious click track in your head, you know. Mm -hmm. That's something also I practice as well, is just really kind of, when I play beats, just really trying to get the groove on it and keep it, you know, keep that flow nice and steady the whole time through. You know, it's real important right. for any band because um, you can have the best guitar player on the planet in your band, but if your drummer sucks and has crappy tempo, that band's going to sound like crap. Mm -hmm. So it's a, playing drums is an extremely important part of any band, you know, sure. for so not just to go up there and be the drummer, but you also, you're, you're, again, you're the, you're the timekeeper of the band and you, you drive that musical train, so uh, it's extremely important. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you mentioned it briefly, and uh, actually uh, Gene Hoagland was here, we did an interview with him, and mm -hmm. I think he does the same thing, but you play open-handed. Yes. Where you don't cross. Right, yeah, Gene way. plays and that way as well, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned how that developed, but what do you think that brings to your playing? Is it, do you think that makes a difference in your style? I think that has, uh, has some advantages and a couple of disadvantages. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. playing open-handed, you know, when you're playing, when you're crossed over, you're as you're going to hit the snare, the windup can only be so far because you're literally smashing your other hand with playing open. And of course, I never realized at the time, um, but you know, you can, you can hit with as much velocity as you want. And it's just, you can, you know, I, I hit relatively hard. I don't, I'm not crushingly, right. I don't hit, the, you know, with brutal force or anything, but I can give it a, quite a good whack, um, which, which affects the tonality of, of, of the snare as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you give it, you know, if you have a nice tap to it, it's gonna sound a certain way, but if you really crack it, it's, you know, the, the tonality of it really shines through and certainly in, in a hard rock or, or heavy metal situation that, that I play in, um, it's certainly beneficial. So I, it, I find it very comfortable. It's, it's easy to, to do roles. I find it maybe a little bit easier. But, uh, you know, there's a couple of disadvantages with it. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you know, that's just how I developed as a, as a player over the years and learned. Um, right. And, but, you know, I look at it, look, if, if it's good enough for Gene, if it's good enough for, for Simon Phillips and Lenny White, then I think it's okay for me as well. Sure, sure. And it's the way you play. Sure. So it's it's the that's, 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 yeah, that's how I play. It's how I express myself, and mm -hmm. I'm very, uh, very comfortable in doing so. Right, yeah. right. So you're here on behalf of Yamaha yep. and uh, Sabian, yep. and you're going to be doing a workshop. Yep. this evening for the, uh, the public here at, at Sweetwater. Tell us a little bit about your association with those brands and what you're going to be doing. 
Well, let's start with we'll start with Sabian because um, essentially I've been I've been playing Sabian uh, pretty much since I was a teenager. I've I've, I've tried other uh, companies' symbols and stuff, but I always seem to gravitate towards Sabian. Um, first and foremost, I mean, when I joined Megadeth, I was of course asked the question, you know, what would you like to play? Well, right off the bat, I said Sabian, um, and I got hooked up with them, and uh, I, I actually play the Hand Hammered series, which to me. Um, in the 10 years I've been with Megadeth, I've, I've had a one hairline fracture on a China symbol. I've never broken <laughs> one crash, nothing. I mean, that's astounding that's in itself. Right? You know, I've, I've always heard in the past and heard from buddies who played, I'm not going to mention other companies and stuff, but, you know, um, cracking symbol. I mean, big, not, I mean, I'm talking crack symbols where you can <laughs> almost rip the symbol in half, like huge cracks in the symbols and, right. and things of that nature. Um, I've never, ever had that issue. Um, again, so that's... And that's such an important thing with being on the road. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in Istanbul, Turkey, and you break three symbols, and you're calling your reps, like, dude, I need, you know what I mean? Right, right. That's a potential problem in itself, unless you have 85 symbols in the back of the truck, right. which, you know right. what I mean? So durability is, is an important uh, part of having any instrument. You know, you don't want things breaking on stage mm -hmm. in the studio, things of that nature. Um, so that really, really impressed me. Not even talking about how they sound. Sonically, they sound fantastic. I love them. I just... They, they're, they're kind of dark sounding in a way. They, they're really suitable for what I do in Megadeth. I really love them. The only thing that is different, uh, which I've been using um, in the last couple, maybe two or three years now, is I'm using the, uh, the Paragon hi-hats. I've, I've had 13s and 14s, mm -hmm. and I've used them both in the studio and in and, and the live situation, both sizes. And they just, to me, and uh, the hand hammers are amazing as well, and I used them for several years, but I just kind of wanted to swap just mix it up a little bit, do something sure. instead of just being exclusive to, to hand hammered. Um, I wanted to, you know, try something a little bit different, which I did. And, and I'm really glad I did because they, they sound fantastic. And I just, they just have the nice, they have a, a crispness to them and they, and they just feel great when you hit them. You know, some symbols, if, if you, I've hit symbols over the years where they, it's almost like hitting a friggin' rock. You know, they don't right. feel, it doesn't feel right. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? For me, for what I do. I like to kind of have, you know, I want it to feel smooth when I hit it. I don't want like, like I feel like I'm hitting a wall or something like that, you know, or right. something too abrasive, um, which can also land in breaking sticks and all that kind mm -hmm. of, but that's another conversation. But um, again, uh, they sound fantastic. Um, I love them. I, I've never played anything else. Uh, I've played the, the, the HHs for, for over 10 years now, and uh, I can't say enough uh, great things about them. They're just, uh, They're great what, can you, what can you say? I yeah. mean, I just... Yeah, I just yeah. gave you 58 reasons uh, to say that they're great, but they're, they're fantastic. I love them. Um, right. Yamaha, uh, I just started with them this year. Um, mm -hmm. I was on tour uh, with my previous uh, company, which I played for several years, and, and I was starting to notice more and more that the bands that were supporting us had a better drum tone than I did, mm. and that was um, bothering me. Mm -hmm. And I began to ask myself, why? Why am I not playing the best kit in the world? So thus began my, I started to get really aggravated about it and um, not to say anything bad about, about any previous companies or anything like that because essentially everybody has to make great drums to compete with each other. Sure. So no disrespect or anything, but I, I, and at the same time, I kind of wanted to change. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes you can get kind of like, you, you lose that excitement to, to play the instrument or something. I, I was kind of feeling that, like I wanted to, I wanted to get excited again. I wanted to, to switch it up and do something different, you know? Mm -hmm. So all these emotions were kind of running through me and, and, uh, and uh, I just, just started to really think about it and ponder it. And so I made a move and I was a free agent at that point and thus began the, the search to talk to all the comp perspective, you know, companies, which, to which they're all great, of course. Right. And um, oddly enough, it's funny because I, I've been playing uh, the Yamaha bass drum pedals for about four or five years because we're on tour with um, a band called Machine Head with Dave McLean, who was, was playing. Uh, he switched over to Yamaha as well. Mm -hmm. And I jumped on his kit and I was like, wow, these pedals feel just great. You know, they, I just, they feel great and I just love them. And so he gave me a, the, uh, Greg Crane's number with, uh, with Yamaha. And I, that, that began, uh, began essentially my relationship with, with Yamaha. And uh, I stayed in touch with him over the years just because of buying, you know, getting, getting the pedals from him and stuff. And um, right. when I made the move, you know, I, it's funny, I kept going back to, to this company. It's like, you know, I could have went with company A, B, C, or D, with, and they would, would all been fantastic. But, and with that said, I had a personal relationship with Greg, and I knew he was a great guy. And, th and that means something to me, mm -hmm. you know, not just having them, you know, to say, okay, I play 
Yamaha or I play Sabian or I use Promark drumsticks. I actually have a personal relationship with all of my endorsers. They're all friends of mine. I, I consider them all great friends. Mm -hmm. And I've been with most of them for many, many years now. So that, that means a lot to me as well. So um, that ultimately kind of made my, dis partially made my decision was because of Greg. And, but also too, they, they, they were just coming out with, uh, with the absolute hybrid maple. And once I actually hit this kit, in, uh, this kit was in the, where, uh, in the, um, the showcase room in, in uh, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, that pretty much sealed the deal, was actually this actual kit. Wow. And uh, the, tonal the, the tonality of it, it the, the resonance of it, it resonates beautifully, but it doesn't, like, what's the term, maybe over resonate. There's some drums I've hit right. where they like resonate, and you come back next Sunday and it still resonates. <laughs> right. like, that's, and that's kind of can be problematic in the studio. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have, and I've actually run into that situation once or twice over the years of recording, but the decay on this is just, a, to me, it's just, it's, it's perfect. It's not too much. It's not overbearing, but it just, it just has a beautiful tone to it. Um, the functionality, I mean, uh, there's just, again, I can go into this for, for half an hour if you'd like, but, you know, um, for me, I, I always want to feel like I'm playing the best instruments. Otherwise, why, why am I playing them? Right. Because I have to represent myself and ultimately my band. Mm -hmm. Again, and it goes back to, you know, uh, preserving the legacy of Megadeth and making sure everybody gets the, the best performance and the best sounds possible. So, right. um, so that's really why I ultimately chose uh, Yamaha for, you know, at the end of the day, they, in my eyes, they have to set my ears. They have to be the best. And, and mm -hmm. uh, for me, I think I really, I'm really at a spot now where everything that I use I can honestly say is, is the best stuff on the planet, in, in, right. from my perspective. Right, right, that's awesome, that's yeah. awesome. Well, you were playing just a minute ago and it's all mic'd up and going through the, the uh, PA system here mm -hmm. in the, the Sweetwater Theater, it sounded incredible. I mean, it's really, Great. really pounding. I think people tonight are gonna be in for a, a real treat to get to uh, check out the workshop. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, for, for what I do, it's, it's, it's a real fun thing. I, I, I keep it light, it's not, I don't sit back and, and give out pamphlets and, and talk about rudiments and stick control for an hour and a half and then everybody falls asleep and I'll have to wake them up. <laughs> I try to keep it fun and, and, and communicate with them and, and uh, answer questions and, and uh, so it's, it's, it's a good time and, and uh, I've come to appreciate it. You know, I've been doing this now for about, I've been doing clinics and these kind of things for about four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first, of course, doing the first one, I was absolutely terrified because of the, the, the guy, the clinicians, the guys who really are the masters of that craft of doing that, and and um, it's funny. I actually talked to uh, Carmen Apice, and and I, I said, you know, hey, I'm getting ready to do my first clinic. You know, what advice would you give me? He said, don't play too much. Yeah. I said, okay. So because the people want you to communicate with them, they want to talk about mm -hmm. essentially what you do, what band you play in, questions about certain songs, and then you know things related to the band that I'm in, which is fine. I said, you know, that's I'm cool with that. It's, you know. I'm not nervous about that at all. That, that I'm very comfortable with talking about what I do and, and the band I play and the songs that I play and I can break down things that I do. That, that's, that's easy and, and, and I'm very comfortable with it. So right. with that said, that, that makes it, at the end of the day, it makes it a lot more fun for me because I'm not like backstage, like biting my, you know what I mean? I, I look forward to this. this is, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm jacked up about doing it. So I'm really glad to be, uh, really glad I made the decision to do this, you know, four years ago because it's really become a fun thing for me and it's, it's fun to talk and communicate with the people who show up. That's great. That's great. Well, we're really looking forward to it. We're excited to uh, hear you play and, and uh, have you share your experience and your knowledge with us. Thanks, man. And congratulations on 10 years of Megadeth. Thank What's you. What's next? What's coming up for you guys? We're kind of on a break now. Uh, the first break, really, honestly, the first break we've had in 10 years. Mm -hmm. we, we've been so hardcore with, you know, um, write the record, record the record, tour for the record, videos, repeat. It's just, you know, okay, the tour cycle's over. We go out for a year and a half, come back. Okay, let's, let's you know, right. while we're on tour, we're writing the next record, so kind of taking a step back a little bit and uh, it, it's good. It's, it, for me, it's good and it's bad. I, I, I enjoy, of course, being home with my family and stuff, but I like to work. I like to stay busy. I like to do things, that, you know. So again, this, this is another opportunity for me to get out there and, and, uh, and work and, and uh, do something that I love doing and, and uh, being in this kind of situation. So I, I appreciate uh, being able to do this. And certainly I'm thrilled to be here at the Sweetwater. This wow. place is fantastic. So. Thank you. Thank you. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks for spending time with us. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. <laughs>